Hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you so much for making it here for what I am sure is going to be a fabulous session with two of the most incredible writers in history that are speaking at JLF this year and whose books I really encourage you to go pick up and read after. Today's session is about navigating the past, negotiating the present or negotiating the past, negotiating the present. And it's a particular delight to be discussing this with both Anjum and uh, Tanya because I think both their novels explore what it means to contextualize history in the present times, what it means to navigate not just the facts of the past, but the very act of interpreting the past. And both their works are not entirely political in a sense that they have a very direct political message that they want to leave you with. But they raise so many important questions about the ways in which history has been a site of contested realities today. So I want to start off this conversation by giving you a brief insight and asking them to share a little bit about their two wonderful books. And I want to start with you, Tanya, because Tanya's book is around this fabulous object, Tipu's Tiger. And it's this object of intrigue. It's currently at the VNA. It's been a subject of mystery for almost two centuries now. It's one that animates discourse, but an object that we know very little about. So tell us what prompted this wild goose chase for Tipu's tiger and the stories that emerged from it. It was, it was a wild. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, OK. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so Tipu's tiger, I can't, well, let me explain a little bit about what it is. It's actually, has anybody seen it? Um, OK, one person. It's it, a enormous. Uh, mechanical tiger, an automaton, which is sort of a prototype, uh, uh, pro a prototype of a robot. It's about as wide as my wingspan, and it's an enormous tiger, a wooden tiger that's mauling the throat of a prone British soldier. And um, back in the day when it worked, you could turn a hand crank and the tiger would grunt and the soldier would groan and sort of pathetically flap his hand while being eaten. And then there was an organ inside the body of the tiger, so you could have a nice uh, soundtrack to this whole scene. And it was commissioned by um, the ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan, who, as you many of you probably know or have guessed, um, hated the British East India Company. And he had this um, this huge, enormous toy made basically for his sons who had just been returned um, as ho they were hostages um, of uh, General Cornwallis. And so I just was so fascinated by this object. I had never seen anything like it. To me, uh, there was a kind of dark irreverence to it. There was this sort of, um, there's this kind of absurdism to it. And it was, you know, this, this kind of sinister anti-colonialist bent almost. And I, st I just kept thinking, I want this is where the novel starts. I want to write a novel about two characters. It's going to be a heist novel. It's going to be sent, set in an English country home, and these two characters are going to try to get it back. But the more I kept thinking about what would, what would make someone do this, what would make someone risk their life and their reputation to get this automaton, I kept thinking about the makers of the automaton. Who were they? Um, and so that's when I started going back and back and, and trying to do some research into who those people were. And you know, if Tipu's tiger is the sort of driving force behind your novel, Anjum, the driving force behind your novel, History's Angel, is a city. It's Delhi, which I only recently discovered uh, Anjum has never lived in. And it's a city that comes to life in the most wonderful way through your protagonist, Aleph, who's a lover of Delhi. So can you tell us a little more about how you found this school teacher who loves Delhi and the history of the city and what that taught you about the city and what drove you towards loving the city too? Yeah, I think of, can you hear me? Yeah, is it audible? I yeah. think so, yeah, you can. Mm, I tend to write about characters at an angle, if not at odds, with the world. And uh, this one is no different. Alif Muhammad in History's Angel. But he's at an angle in ways that are very low-key, unassuming, unambitious. He just is actually just a regular guy. He has a very, very 
laid back kind of job, I would say, till till things started changing in India around the teaching of history. I mean, I didn't grow up in an era where the teaching of history was contentious at all. It was uh, either business as usual or deeply boring, but never a matter of controversy. Um, and it's so fascinating to me now that the whole battle is over the textbook, because I think when I was growing up, the question always was, how interesting is the teacher of history? Who's your teacher? What is she doing to the textbook or he? Uh, and that's why now to me, the fact that what is in the textbook becomes most important is, I think, fascinating to a novelist because then I move the lens to the teacher and ask, is the teacher relevant at all then? If it really, what really matters is what's in and what's out in the book. So that was one of the triggers to write a character who's a teacher of history. But in other ways, I wanted to make him completely easygoing. So he's never left Delhi. He was born there. He doesn't want to go anywhere. He hates traveling. Um, he knows certain parts of Delhi, Delhi very well, is uncomfortable in others, uh, lives in old Delhi, walks around it with the eyes still of a lover and a, and a critic, right? He, the things he, he, he's deeply conscious of and identifies with, like Jama Masjid, where he sits every evening, Humayun's tomb a little further out, where he takes his students at the beginning of the novel. But I wouldn't consider him a nostalgist, yeah. you know, because he also runs into like groups of day trippers who come to Old Delhi to do, to do Old Delhi, and he feels like, I don't... I don't belong here. I mean, I don't either want to be the object of their nostalgia, nor I, am I one of them. So I wanted to create a thinking guy who's not up to much. And what happens to that combination in today's Delhi, where apart from what's in the textbook, there are many other ways in which you can be tripped, in which you can fall. And one of them, of course, is being a Muslim, being a liberal Muslim, uh, living in old Delhi, um, have working in an institution uh, uh, that also institutional structures can be challenging for and certain kinds is, of people. This is, I think, the tension in the novel, right? That you have an incredible character, Aleph, who's a lover of history and you want to love him. But he's surrounded by others who negotiate history very differently than he does. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned history was always boring. I remember the one thing that I remember from my history class in school was my history teacher telling us about a tomato plant that was growing on her sewer. And this was the most exciting thing that I remember from history class. Mm -hmm. But in your book, the classroom is an intensely political space, not just for the teacher, but for the students. It's animating conversations that students are having, that their parents are sort of shoving down their throats. It's reflected in the sort of spaces that Aleph occupies. Uh, what makes a belief in history important when nobody else around you seems to have much to do with it. Yeah, again, I was setting up a contrast there, like you say, between somebody who I think has a historical sense. It's not just about the facts, because we all went to school. We all imbibe some degree of historical facts. So everyone's on the same footing in that sense. But Alif is also somebody who sees the march of the ages, who places things in their context, and who sees himself as a product of that whole long march. In that sense, he's a Nehruvian, and the one book he keeps rereading through the novel is The Discovery of India. Uh, and I can't think of a better example that illustrates the march of the ages. Nehru is doing that consistently in relation to the Indian subcontinent. So that's Aleph's imagination. And it's not as if the others around him are not aware of, the, of what happened in India. His wife, for instance, has her own views on partition. Uh, his buddy, drinking buddy, Ganesh, knows the facts but is not particularly concerned. His father feels that what's more important is having a practical, uh, driven nature, seizing the moment, being a good citizen rather than caring for what happened in the past. So they all have their own take on what's happened, include, and especially his school principal. That's yeah. where the big clash happens. His school prin principal really thinks he's bringing things in that are of no importance at all. So all of these people have their point of view, but I think 
in their case, it drives them to do things, take positions, maybe even be aggressive, maybe even be violent. Whereas Aleph, for Aleph, it's just a way of being in the present. He doesn't want to do anything about it. He doesn't even want to write. He's tr yeah. been trying to write a book for very long. He had a lot of promise as a student, <laughs> but he's so um, bewitched by history that he can't actually produce scholarship on it. And he's a parvana of sorts, you know, he's this, he's fallen in love with history. And I want to push a little bit more on this historical sensibility or historic sense, because that's a very important part of the novel, right? That Aleph is a character who knows the past, he's avowedly secular, he's not somebody who's mobilizing history to certain ends. He knows the different facts and acknowledges that history cannot be told only from one perspective and tries to reiterate this time and again. What is this sort of historical sense doing to him? How do you think it molds him as a person? Does it make him more tolerant? Does it make him more wise? Does it introduce some flaws which we see over the course of the novel? I think a character like Alif, uh in the period in which India became free, in those decades, before India became free, during and after, would have been par for the course. He's a classic Nehruvian, right? So there would have been nothing extraordinary about his secular leanings. There would have been nothing extraordinary about his view that India is this palimpsest and people have come here over the ages and added their bit and it has created this layered country which we all in different ways belong to. It's, an, it's a view that has been challenged. There are romantic angles to it, there are exaggerations, there is papering over, but that's the view that is the foundation of, I think, the idea of India. There's no two ways about it. That was what we started with. Right? So but you know, isn't that idea of India crumbling? The idea of India that is idealized in Alif crumbles right in front of him. So when he's going to find a house as a Muslim absolutely. man, and he's realizing that even if you give facts to somebody, yeah. the sort of vitriol that's coming your way cannot be met with logic. Yeah. And his own family, you know, yeah. his wife is particularly upset. There's Ahmad, who's the help at his father's house, yeah. who refuses to understand why such an educated man yeah. He's not using his pen towards a righteous cause. So what is, what, is he passive? Is, is, is this overbearing historical sense leaving him just neutral or almost neutered? Well, I think I wanted to exercise the freedom here to write about that character and see what happens. Do I come up with something completely dispiriting or is there hope in just being able to imagine along with Aleph what the world looks like? I think for a novelist that's, that's as far as you can uh, do, yeah. right? C can you create a sense of life and imagination through such a character even if he's ineffective and he is? And I think the Nehruvian ideal has become, if not ineffective, completely attenuated, greatly attenuated, right? The challenges to it from so many sides. So I think that he's ineffective in some ways and not in others. I think just, in, just the fact that he insists on creating that space for himself to think and to not uh, jump on the bandwagons that others are on. To me, that's still an idealism that's worth celebrating, right? Uh, we don't want to give away what happens to him. It already sounds like he doesn't fare too well. But I still think that it needn't be um, an object lesson or a parable. I didn't see it as a parable only, you know, about a flawed idealist. I didn't. I, I wanted to explore it very much in a textured, grainy way. Like, we don't know what could happen to a guy like this. You know, maybe he, maybe he could write that book and have a glittering career. Who knows? But, of course, he's particularly dreamy and he's particularly... Uh, waylaid by his own reveries, so things go in a certain direction for him. But uh, yeah, I think I think it still says something for the culture. If I can write a book like this, and we can sit here talking about it, you can read it, Anish, and find something recognizable in it. I think there's still something left if we can still do that. No, absolutely. And I think if Aleph is sort of wayward and a romantic. Abbas, your protagonist, 
is caught in the throes of dramatic changes. So the protagonist in Loot is a young man who is first caught in palace intrigue and then eventually becomes one of the apprentices, uh, apprentices making Tipu's tiger, right? And the protagonist in your book is the sort of receptacle of history changing in front of him. You know, a Tipu Sultan's Mysore is under threat. There's a certain way in which his own identity is under flux because he's moving between countries. Where do you think that leaves him? Because towards the end, you see that he also wants to make a mark. There's a certain sense of historical sensibility that's cultivated within him as he gets tossed around in these forces that are far beyond his control or comprehension also at points. So can you tell us a little more about what happens to Abbas as the world changes around him? Well, he the novel um, takes place at a really kind of pivotal moment in the history of British Empire because until this time, the British East India Company was mostly a trading company. And this is at the point at which they're sort of pivoting to, to become a global aggressive superpower. And so he, you know, I, I to be honest, I don't think he, I'm just thinking about um, what you're saying on, on, about um, your character being so aware of history. I don't think he's aware, my Abbas is aware of history at all. He's sort of so, so kind of narrowly focused on his own dream of becoming this great artist that he, he feels no loyalty to, um, to Tipu Sultan. He feels no loyalty to any, uh, any uh, his background or, or religion. He's just purely on this journey to kind of realize what he thinks of as his destiny to become a great artist. And I, that reflects some of how I felt as I was sort of researching this historical period. I mean, if I had thought about, okay, I am now going to write a novel that's going to touch on the French Revolution. It's going to touch on um, the four Anglo-Mysore Wars. It's going to touch on this uh, pivotal moment for British Empire. I just never would have written the novel. I would have just felt like, who am I to write, to be an authority on any of these things? And I think the only way I sort of was able to move through this research was to think mm -hmm. about, well, I, wrote, I once wrote a short story about two wrestlers named Gama the Great and his brother Imam, and they were turn of the century, ch century wrestlers, and it I took me 23 drafts to learn something crucial, which is that you really only need to use the history that would matter to your characters. And so that that is the way I thought of Abbas's relationship to history. I just immediately, with my research, I used that as a kind of sieve to sort of sift out anything that didn't matter to him, anything he wasn't noticing, I would set aside, but I would be looking at history and thinking, well, what would matter to him? What would what would sort of impact his character? Um, so it was it was kind of, it was, I also just felt like I, 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 I love that this is taking place at a dramatic moment in history, but I also want the novel to have an urgency and a forward movement that's propulsive, and I don't want to kind of get dragged down into sort of teaching the reader so much that, that, that the novel sort of, you know, is static at times. So, so that I was always at the forefront of my mind was thinking about his his journey and his own sort of momentum. And this is we we discussed this a little bit earlier that it is a work of fiction, right? At the end of the day, these are sort of real things. Tipu's tiger exists, but a lot of the characters are invented, a lot of the scenarios are invented. And what struck me is that you're having fun doing it. There's a certain sense of play, there's a certain rhythm to the book. There is that certain sense of urgency that only comes when you're making history your own. And at some times, the facts get thrown to the dustbin, and then at some times, new facts get invented. Yeah. And that allows you to do something very powerful, which is the work of fiction, right? It's not writing history, but it's using a sort of historical setting to tell a different story. So yes. can you tell us a little more about that process? Well, at first, I, I, I was having a hard time in the beginning because I thought, I'm going to research the makers of Tipu's Tiger. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a novel based on real characters. And then I quickly found that there, there is very little written about them. And so I sort of, I knew that the exterior was probably made by local artisan and a local you know, woodworker. And then the interior was probably French. 
And then I, you know, I started just creating characters from the ground up, but then I thought, am I doing, am I crossing some kind of ethical boundary here by, by kind of replacing people who actually existed with my own sort of creations? And then I listened to this interview with the poet Ocean Vuong, and he was talking about this poem he had written about the fall of Saigon. And he said, rather than writing as a witness of history, more like Homer, who was writing 400 years after the Trojan War, I was building a mythology of the history I come from. And I just loved that. It, it sort of gave me the permission to sort of build and step into the void and sort of imagine other possibilities. And that's where the kind of playfulness entered in. And I could, I could kind of play with form and, and sort of play with the voice and bring humor and sort of a, a comic tone at times. And that really made it fun for me. I mean, it's interesting to me that of all my novels, the novel that is about colonialism in many ways was the most fun to write. But it, it, it was, and I think in part because of being liberated enough to just sort of, you know, take my own liberties. And you know, looking to history not as a repository of facts, but rather as this space for imagination and adventure is very appealing to me. But Anjum, this takes a dramatic turn in your novel, right? We see the ways in which ignoring the facts or playing around with them can open up a tinderbox and can have very direct political consequences in the present day. And there's someone like an Aleph who is very keen on establishing the facts and using them to nuance the debate. What do you think are the possibilities opened up when sometimes the facts don't tell the full story and where do you see space for that imagination? Can it be used productively? Do you think it can be dangerous? How do you navigate that sort of distinction between fact and imagination when writing about history? It's a crazily interesting and complex question. But, but what you said, Tanya, is also beautiful and liberating. I was thinking of this poem, and I cannot now remember the name of the poet, uh, with these lines that go, a poem should not mean but be for all the history of grief, an empty doorway and a maple leaf. Do you know who I'm talking about? Does anyone know? No, it's a very famous poem, but I can't remember the poet now. So he's basically saying, distill, distill, distill. For all the history of grief, all you need is an empty doorway and a maple leaf. So, you know, I, because I also write poetry, I understand that impulse to not write histories when we're writing works of imagination to take off from the facts but i didn't have that choice at all <laughs> because i'm writing about a historian who almost has a uh, a would-be historian who almost has a perverse uh takes a perverse joy in um trotting out the facts yeah. to us so i was trying to see if i could even do it to a it's a balancing act of course there is always the danger of boring the reader but to me it would it, I, I thought I could pull it off if I show Aleph to be um, that sort of person, but everyone around him to be uh, very impatient with it, usually, you know? So that provides a sort of um, um, balancing to his obsessive departures into the byways of history. But your question about imagination, fact, distortion, let's say, right? Willful distortion. And of course, there's a difference between willful distortion, instrumental use of histories, uh, short-sightedly political uh, takes on history, and a novelist's license. Yeah. So, these are such different things. So first of all, we have to acknowledge that they're different. And to add to that spectrum is the mythological imagination, which could also take off from history and go into another direction. And we do that as well, right? We mythologize or romanticize from the facts. So I think to be educated is to know that these things are different to begin with. And I think Alif is somebody who would want to make that claim first of all. He's not saying that politics doesn't exist. I mean, he, he, he's a product of the subcontinent's politics and he knows things like partition are deeply emotional. And in fact, he can't be completely unfeeling about something like partition. He feels that there were problems with it, and there's even a point where he feels like crying about it. And then he thinks he can't be a historian because historians don't cry. 
So he's aware that it's not possible always to be completely objective. Willy-nilly as a human, you are partisan, right? But it's the self-awareness. That's all that matters, I think. You know, you're aware that I'm feeling this way because this is who I am, but I, I'm not going to go out and bring down a building, therefore, or bring down a person or bring down anything, right? So that little space between what we're made of, what's gone into us, what we feel strongly about, and what we're going to do as a result of it. You know, the space between thinking and acting, that's, I think, all that matters. Because otherwise, I think there is space for all these things, especially in India. And we just discussed that at every corner, you'll find a site or a story ripe for sort of excavation, but also transformation. You can find a rock that can suddenly take on religious qualities. You can find something whose history you can trace back to a thousand years. And I think there's a particular way in which now, more than ever before, we're learning how to navigate the question of what do you do when the historical record offers no answer. So, you know, for example, for me, a, a hugely influential figure has been Saidia Hartman, who does a lot of work on the transatlantic slave trade and of slaves who were transported across the Atlantic, of whose lives we have no record except for the note of their sale. And how do you then write a history of these lives of full lives that acknowledges that they had stories beyond their sale or beyond their narratives on the slave ships, right? And what does it mean to then call that fiction when the rest of the work that we do is called history? And then does that mean that history can only be written for communities that have had the opportunity to be entered into the formal record? And this is something that I think comes to your work, right? Because Abbas is a character who, if he did exist, would have been written out of history. Who's going to remember The Apprentice? Who sort of uh, come up with this wild goose chase to steal Tipu's tiger? What are these stories that get lost and what does it mean to reimagine them? Even if they were not true, but that also does not mean they could not have been true. Yeah. Well, you, what, you, bringing up Hartman reminds me of a, a painting that I kept thinking about when I was writing the book, and um, it's by Titus Kafar, and um, it hangs in the national or in the Portrait Museum in D.C. And it's a presidential portrait of um, what we think is probably Thomas Jefferson, and but the the canvas is distorted because someone's pulling it to the side, and what you see is this portrait of an enslaved black woman, and she's looking directly at the viewer. And I just love that, that, that that's really, you know, calling attention to the fact that history is distortion and history is subjective and calling attention to that kind of distortion in a way that's it's dark, but it's also kind of playful. It's also sort of like thrilling. And I just, I just loved that and it was something always at the back of my mind. I mean, what, when you're talking about, Anjum, about um, ob objectivity, I, 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 I was thinking about that too and how can I, I really wanted to bring myself into this novel, even though it's a third person novel, I thought one way I could do it is by utilizing the sort of omniscient voice that was popular maybe in 19th century Victorian novels where there's a storyteller and they're actually talking to you, the reader, and we're both, we're both in this story together and sometimes I'm talking over the heads of the characters and we're talking about a piece of history that they're not aware of, but I find absurd and I find funny. And that's sort of a version of myself that's in the novel and again, kind of calling attention to the fact that this is something that's constructed, this is a story, and it's not some kind of faux neutral, um, you know, uh, uh, objective view of history. I'm, I'm telling you what I think is interesting, and I, I want us. And to me, that's a form of play. It's me asking you to play with me. Like that. That again is like part of the thing that made it fun for me. The only other thing I will say is like I, I wished I could find more information about the women in Tipu's court and in his in his Zanana. And a few times I would just switch to their perspective just for a paragraph or a line. And again, that's just another way of saying who we choose as the protagonist or the hero of the story is completely 
you know, random. Anybody, everybody is the protagonist of their own story. It's just that we only know, some people only appear as a footnote, but they have as much complexity and in interior life as our hero. So those are some of the things I was thinking about in terms of distortions of history. Yeah. And I think that, Anjum, and your work is also a sort of looming presence, right? This idea of turning to history as a repository of facts that are often forgotten. And Aleph, in many ways, remembers what very few others remember. And if you read the novel, there's points at which you're just amazed at how he's rattling off facts after facts after facts and how he knows so much. Because that's all that he's invested in. And he's sort of crafting these life forms out of these facts. But the, the characters in your novels operate on different temporalities. If Aleph is living primarily in the past, his wife and son are living in a future. They're not concerned with history. They want to move to Noida or they want to go to Gurgaon and work at Saket Select City Walk or a mall in Saket. And they don't want any of this business around them. But history catches up even to them. So what does one do when running away from history is not the solution, when delving only into history is not the solution, and history seems to be engulfing you from all sides? Well, the title of the novel is uh, what it is, History's Angel, and it's taken from a very famous uh, series of little uh, mini essays that come together in a bigger essay by Walter Benjamin called Thesis on the Philosophy of History. And he critiques many prevalent views of history. One of the w views of history that he thinks is ineffective, regressive, needs to be examined critically is this idea that history is just a stepping stone to the future. You know, the progressive view that was coming into effect post-enlightenment in Europe, which is that post-industrial revolution Europe as well, which is that, you know, we've got to look ahead and we've got to sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our grandchildren. It's a completely frontal, forward-facing view. So history there becomes completely instrumental. It doesn't matter what the sacrifices were. It doesn't matter how much has happened. It's all grist to the mill of the future, right? It's a particular very, very um, instrumental, productivist view of history. And I think we've, in India, in the 21st century, in the last decade especially, we've all internalized that so much that it seems like completely normal for us to believe that we should just be moving in one direction that's ahead. And what are the available models for moving ahead? It's Select City Mall or, yeah. you know, uh, the boy, Salim, who's 14, not wanting to study because he thinks, how is this going to help me make money? So, you know, there, we, we are all products of certain views of history, whether we realize it or not. We all are. And so they are as well, and Alif sees that. But, of course, like you're saying, his own passivity, if not apathy, is also not particularly helpful in many confrontational situations, right? So, I don't know, Anish. I'm not you know, offering... There's a like, I don't have <laughs> I don't have a solution. It's but not. You know, I think there's something magical about Aleph as a character because he's not offering easy answers. You know, history's angel, again, is evocative of almost a sort of missionary position that he occupies, sort of Catholic position that he has in this belief in history for history. It doesn't matter if it's going to be used towards some end. History, as you said, is not instrumental. It's not a stepping stone to the future. It's valuable because it exists and in and of itself. Yeah. And there's a certain way in which there is a belief in history that's almost religious. You know, he's avowedly secular, but his love for history is not rational, right? In many circumstances, you see that it does not hold water in an age where it is being discarded very quickly. And his belief in history is not taking him very far. What do you think is the driving force for an Aleph to continue that belief in history? Because that's something I struggle with. You know, like, despite all of this, what is that kernel of belief that says, no, history is still important? 
Well, to go back to the Benjamin essay, I mean, he's, he's coming from the left and his idea is, in fact, act, action. How does the underdog, how does the figure of the oppressed use history to turn things around in their favor? It is a very, it's very much a position coming out of a belief in the revolutionary potential of history. Okay, so, and Alif is not that kind of figure. So I'm also talking about people who may have, ha who may have that access to history, who may believe in it, but who are paralyzed, who are not able to act in the way that they could and, you know. So somehow his moment has passed. Mm. Alif is an anachronism, I think. But I still think anachronisms still have their value if uh, they remind us maybe of things that we could retrieve, recover. And like I said at the beginning, all Aleph is really arguing for is space for reflection. You know, that's all, that's the kernel yeah. that you're asking for. And time and again in the novel, his way of going into these reveries, I mean, they may be about whatever period in Indian history, they may seem completely unrelated to what's going on in front of his eyes, but they're his way of saying that I should be allowed my, 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 my dreaminess, you know? That's where I want to, that's what I want to nail my, that's where what I want to nail my flag to, that space, right? Where these things have happened and they still seem like they have some kind of bearing on what's going on today. So I think, again, to ask what's the use of it is to take a very instrumentalist view of things. Yeah. Like, not everything has a value in that sense. You know, again, it's a very, it's a very new liberal thing that, you know, everything has to, be f has to feed in, into something. And if that was the view, we wouldn't have had art, the arts at all. Yeah. Because the arts operates with an idea of the useless, the, the marginal, the footnote, the instrumental. So I think in that sense, he's an artistic figure, even though it's history that is the ballast for, for Aleph and for the novel. What he's really arguing for is space, self-awareness, dreaminess, you know, taking things less seriously in a way than other people do. Yeah. Actually, he's taking ambition and worldly success much less seriously than everyone around him. And I think I want to ask this last question to you before we move on to questions from the audience. So please keep your questions ready. What struck me the most about your novel, Tanya, is that in many ways, this is not something new, this sort of creation of history and a, and a very acknowledged creation of history and changing of narrative is not something that's only happening today. A Tipu Sultan who's creating a Tipu's tiger, which is sort of chopping off an Englishman, creating an organ music of a very different kind, is a way of reversing a narrative of subjugation, of oppression, by a king who is very confident in himself and is saying that, you know what, if you can be racist towards me and to my people, which we see later on the novel, I'm going to have this little toy, this automaton of grand proportions that's going to be hacking away at you in a sort of symbol of strength. Where do you think that, that leaves us today? What do you think is the possibility? Of course, we see that being done with a Tipu who's again in a position of power. But I want to draw it down to an Abbas and an individual who also tries to rewrite history and craft a narrative in his own way to leave a mark. So how do we go from history's angels to also history's agents, and what is that? What is that impulse that is driving the urge to become history's agent? I mean, I I think of, I think that's true. That in his um, in one sense, to a certain viewer, that object represents you know um, sort of anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, and defiance. But I will say that when it was moved, initially moved and brought to England, it was a big sensation. And a lot of people used it as a sort of um, 
as a reason why, ju for a just reason to justify why the English the East India Company had to invade India, because look at what they were going to do to us. Look how savage they are. Look how brutal they are. Um, and so I guess my point is that this those sort of object changes in meaning depending on who is looking at it, and we bring to it what we bring to it our own stories, and there are stories beneath those stories, and so. Um, that that feels like to me a timeless and kind of ever present sort of idea that we project onto works of art or we project onto these iconic images um, what we want to see, and in some ways, I mean, I think about I think about historical fiction to me is as much about the past as it is about the present. It's a portrait of where we are now as well because I myself as a product I am a product of the present. Therefore, my kind of concerns filter in. But I think, you know, you know, certainly as when I first encountered Tibu's Tiger, I was thinking about what did it mean to different people as it passed through these different places. Yeah. And with that, can we have any audience questions? Because we have around five to seven minutes. In the second row there, the gentleman with the cap. If you could hand him a mic, please. Thank you for the lovely session. Uh, exactly, I'm not able to recall it, but there's this saying around if uh, tigers wrote the history, then it wouldn't favor the hunter. Uh, so as we quoted here, instead of making it a repository of facts, and we are using it as a space of imagination, how does it, like, how do you think it shapes the perspective of the present reader? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so how do you think if history is written by the victor, or it's written by those in positions of power, then what does it mean to see history as a site of imagination if it's only being written by those in positions of power? Is that, did I catch, yeah. And how does that shape the present? So who is getting to write this history? Right, I mean, I think um, as, I think what, so insofar as um, whenever history is just written from one perspective, I think that veers close to propaganda usually, and and it has a sort of flattening effect on and and it has a kind of message-driven agenda, and the more voices that are kind of uh, a part of creating the story or part of creating the history and sort of acknowledging the ongoingness and the endlessness and the impossibility of ever capturing the truth in capital letter T, um, I think that's where. I think that's where fiction's power is. That's where, to me, that's what's interesting about historical fiction in offering a sort of, um, offering the possibility of, of multitudes. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but thank you. Other questions in the audience? The first row, the gentleman right there. Uh, hi, so uh, one thing, uh, the poem you were thinking about was Ask Poetica by Archibald MacLeish. Uh, yeah, uh, and also I wanted to ask, uh, what do you all make of typical Marxist materialist conceptions of history in, as in after what we've seen happen over the last, say, 70 years or whatever? What, is, what do you think the current position on historical materialism should be? And where it sh what should we look at as going forward? I think that Aleph would be better equipped to answer <laughs> that question. But I, I mean, like I said, I think the idea of the revolutionary potential, you know, is very, very attractive. It has had a very mixed career, as we know. It's ended up in unexpected places, to say the least, uh, in in societies where it's supposed to be vested with the people, but it very quickly is vested with those in power. They take over um, what is supposed to be a people's movement. We've, we've seen this happen throughout history in Russia, in China, that very, very community, communitarian minded movements end up in the exact opposite place. Is that a fault of the theory or is it a fault of shortcoming of human character? I don't know. Right, but um, it doesn't render the idea invalid or uh, 
worthy of completely dismissing. I think it's still, there's still hope, I think. That's all I think that, that's what Alif would say, I guess. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, the lady in the second row. Hello. Um, so you talked about how when writing your character, you sort of discarded the parts of history or like didn't look at them as much that he wouldn't look at. And that really made me think about, wow, what parts of history do I not look at? So I wanted to ask you about like, how is that a realization that you come through? Like what reflections do you make? How do you look back at history to realize, oh, these specific things I'm not noticing? Is it even inherently a bad thing to not notice these things? Um, I'm thinking in terms of like so many non-canon narratives or personal history that probably shapes me that I don't know about. So how do you come to that realization? And then also, how do you work to then notice those things and find out more about them? One way I can think of is attending history class more often. But um, outside of academia or outside of class, how do you come to those realizations? I think that in the initial drafts of any story, I feel distant from the character. And I'm trying to convince myself that the, I have the authority to tell this story. So I'm foregrounding the history that I've learned because I, it's, I'm convincing myself and hopefully a reader, um, I know what I'm talking about. But for me, I really only know what I ta I'm talking about when I have a sense of the character beyond history. So maybe their back pain or their, you know, just the, just the normal things that I have maybe experienced or have some knowledge of, fear of the dark. I gave one character just a fear of going into the potato cellar because when I was a kid I was afraid of going into the basement. Uh, so, so it's giving them my sort of like personal, those quick things that I immediately, they're kind of crisp on the page. And then I know, and then I, once I know them, it's almost intuitive. I know like what, I can feel where they're just not in the scene. They're not in their bodies. They're just sort of floating, ab you know, floating above the, the scene and, and it's, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel immersive um, in the way that I want it to be. And so I just know that the initial drafts always have a glut of stuff that doesn't really matter to the character, and then I just have to find my way personally to the character, and then I can cut back on the other stuff. Yeah. And we have time for one last question. Lady at the back there. Oh, oh, the, we'll take two of them together. The lady at the back and the, the lady in the first row, please. Hi, thank you for a very, very stimulating session. So taking this, uh, the preceding question forward, what do you think is the difference between, say, a historic imagination, a literary imagination, and since you also mentioned mythology, a mythological imagination, you know, if you're using the same event or whatever. So, and in your works, how did you, because obviously all three are bound to intersect, but how do you tease out the mythological from, or, you know, the constructed, uh, and one of, I teach history and one of my, and you know, forever we are being made to uh, justify why is the teaching of history important. So one of my favorite quotes is from an ancient philosopher, Heraclitus, I think. He says, history teaching is uh, like teaching philosophy with examples. So that is something that I really like. So your responses. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, ahead, I don't have a profound question. Hers was very good. Uh, wonderfully moderated. Just wanted a question. Observation: Alif could not be, wants to be, but he's not allowed to be because he's a Muslim. And I was wondering, a person, say a Hindu, with all his privilege of being part of the majority community, is he also not given the luxury of just being, say, in this current scenario? And I wonder if that there is a character like that in the book. But uh, please answer her question. Mine was just an observation. Well, yeah, I, I certainly think his being a Muslim is in some ways a handicap given his situation. But he has friends who are equally liberal and feel a similar, if not exactly the same sense of being hobbled by what's going on. So I didn't want to set it up as a very black and white uh, this side or that side kind of uh, divide. Uh, and it isn't, you'll find out if you read the novel. But it's, it's interesting to kind of mix things. I, I find it interesting to take people who have very hard positions, uh, and there are certainly some in the novel, but then also to have characters like Alif and some of his friends 
who are constantly having to revise, rethink, defend what they feel, which is neither camp A or camp B. It's a living problem to be Alif Muhammad. It's not sorted ever, and I don't even know if it's sorted on the last page, because if it was not a living problem, you couldn't write a novel about it. So, you know, that's for me the creative thing. If he was already a particular kind of political figure, there would be no reason to write the novel. So, yeah.